You are listening to the podcast of Calvary Church in Irwin, Pennsylvania. For more information, you can visit us online at calvaryirwin.com. And if I never had the chance to meet you yet, my name is Michael and I serve as one of the pastors on staff here at Calvary. And just as Pastor Nick and Sharon mentioned, if this is your first Sunday with us or you classify yourself as maybe new or newish to Calvary, we would love to connect with you. We'd love to meet you. We would love to just have a conversation with you, how you heard about Calvary, and just really ask some simple questions, just get to know you. We have a team called our uh, Connect Team, which is if you leave the sanctuary and you head out to our foyer at our Connection Center, we have a team out there would love to, to ask you those questions, love to meet you. We also have, have a gift as our way of saying Thank you for joining us. We know that schedules on Sunday morning can be hectic and and can be stressful, and you've carved out about an hour, hour and a half of your Sunday morning to gather and to worship with us. So I just wanna say thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you for the staff here at Calvary for doing that. And lastly, if you've decided to follow Christ, you've never taken the step to be publicly baptized. November 5th, Uh, which is in two Sundays, is we have our fall baptisms. I would encourage you, if you're wrestling through this, if you're processing through it, take that time, pray about it, process it, ask some healthy, good questions about water baptisms. Uh, Again, we have a staff, we have individuals in our church that can help you walk through that process. But November 5th, and if you'd be interested in getting baptized, you can go to connect.calvaryrun.com and click the events tab. And this morning, we are continuing our series uh, entitled what we titled, Don't Be an Idiot. You know, and from the outset, that title might seem brash or or really harsh if you don't know the context of this sermon series. But this sermon series, uh, Don't Be an Idiot, is really these next, really two weeks, but in total five weeks, is to help all of us in certain areas of our life where we might make foolish or stupid decisions, we can then look at God's word and how we can apply God's eternal truth to our everyday lives. You know, and if you've, been with, if you've been with us for some time throughout this series, so far we've covered the very first week is don't be an idiot with your life. And that was just really an overview of the book of Proverbs, just walking through Proverbs and, and what are Proverbs in the Bible. The second week we looked at don't be an idiot with your money. Really, Pastor Nick just walked through some practical wisdom, some tools and some resources of how to handle money. Last week we talked about don't be an idiot with your words. Three phases of your words is your words towards others, your words about yourself, which is self-talk, but ultimately, they all hinge on what God says about you, so God's words towards you. And today, I wanna continue this sermon series talking about a, I would argue, a challenging place for all of us who are Christ followers to be in, and I would argue that it's actually becoming more and more difficult to operate in that space if you're a Christ follower, and it's this, it's your work. It is your work or your workplace. And if you take notes, to, uh, today's title uh, of the sermon is Don't Be an Idiot with Your Work. Or better yet, I want to propose a question to you. And really, this is the lens at which we're going to look through God's word today is how can I honor God in my workplace? Is how can I honor God in my workplace? Would you pray with me this morning? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to, to gather every single Sunday. God, help all of us, whether they're in the house or watching online, God, not take it for granted. God, I thank you that you've you've shown up today, God, and that you continue to show up today. God, I pray as as I communicate from this platform today, God, that people will not see me on this platform, God, that people will see you speaking through me. God, I'm always reminded as I speak from this stage that I must decrease and that you must increase. God, I ask that if there are words in my notes or in my message that are are off, God, I ask that I don't communicate those. God, I also ask that the words that I'm gonna say this morning, God, land on hearts that are receptive to hear what you have in store for them. God, use these words today for your glory and for your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, every week we have uh, life groups that function uh, around our campus or throughout our local area. You know, people are connecting and and conversations are happening. And I've been trying to, over this last semester, we're going into, uh, I believe, week seven, week eight. I've been trying to equip and empower all of our life group hosts uh, around some best practices to further train and to further equip some of the hosts 
here at Calvary. And some of the hosts here at Calvary are actually new hosts that have never, ever hosted a life group before. And it is my responsibility to equip them with some best practices. I'm the type of personality that I don't like to waste time and I hope that I don't wanna waste your time. So in sharing some best practices, I hope that your life group gathering every single week or bi-weekly or once a month, that you are able to get and gain as much as you can out of that time of, of gathering. And one of the best practices that I've been sharing with some of our life group hosts this semester so far is praying for your life group is, uh, there's a term called shoulder tapping, just asking people to join your life group by yourself, word of mouth or word of invite. But one of the best practices I wanna share with you today is open up with an icebreaker question if possible. And if you're in the house or watching online, some of you might have cringed at hearing those words of icebreaker questions. And that might have been just an experience that you've had at your workplace with friends, maybe with family and ask, or being asked those questions of icebreaker questions. Or maybe you were on the, the flip side of that and you asked those questions in your workplace with your friends, with your family, and you've gotten no response whatsoever. It was super awkward. But what I've shared through that best practices is that icebreaker questions actually have a list of quality um, benefits, if you will, for asking those types of questions, and they're this. They, they let people practice speaking, but also listening to others. They build relationships and strengthen connections, create team and organizational culture. They encourage participants to open up with one another and share ideas. They promote communication within a team. And there's just a few more of those benefits, and that list, honestly, can go on. But one of my favorite types of icebreaker questions that I love asking but also love being asked is this or that questions. And I'm sure that you've maybe heard of the this or that types of questions or maybe you've never heard of this or that questions. But in those questions, there's usually a theme built around those questions, whether it's movies, whether it's an activity, whether it's something happening in culture, season of life, food, whatever the case may be. And in those questions, there are two choices, i.e. this or that. And you are encouraged to not even think about your answer and respond on the moment or in that instant. And this morning, we're gonna have just a little fun, engaging ac activity. Uh, there's gonna be a, a list of 10 this or that questions that are gonna come across the screen. And if you're watching online, I encourage whether it's through Facebook or YouTube to type out your answers in the chat. And if you're here in the house with us this morning, I encourage you to, as you see these questions come across the screen, to shout out your answers. We're gonna have just a simple engaging activity. Yell it, uh, don't yell at the top of your lungs, but please say it so that people around you can hear it, but just take note of your answers that people around you might look at you pretty funny based off of your answers. Uh, we're gonna start with a very simple one. Uh, it is also a highly debatable topic. Uh, the very first one is Apple or Android. I'm in the right place. I heard a bunch of Apple. I heard a bunch of Apple. Uh, again, as you see these questions kind of run throughout the, the screen or run on the screen, uh, please just shout out your answer. The next one is Mac or PC. Oh, that was split. That was split. Next one, cats or dogs? There we go. Praise Jesus. <laughs> Cake or ice cream? There we go. Somebody said both. There we go. Uh, the beach or the, the beach or the woods? Ah, split again. I'm the woods. Fall or summer? A lot of falls right there. Perfect time of year. Facebook or Instagram? I couldn't tell on that one. Next one. Football or baseball? Oh, I heard one random baseball. Lunchtime or gym class? There we go. I'm in the midst of foodies. Let's go. Next one, Marvel or DC? I think Pastor Nick would maybe say Star Wars on that one. Uh, next one, outer space or the bottom of the ocean? Side note, I actually touched the bottom of the ocean one time. We were in Florida, and we were on vacation the, the first year we got married. It was super hot. It was maybe in the 90s, 95 degrees, something like that. Put on sunscreen. Uh, I'm as white as a ghost, so I don't want to get burnt. But I was uh, putting on sunscreen, letting it dry, and uh, I just ran into the ocean, not knowing of how shallow the ocean was. Jumped in, touched the bottom of the ocean. That is my story. Uh, last one. Coffee or tea? Coffee. Praise Jesus. I'm home. 
When you think of uh, this or that questions, uh, you're not supposed to really think about the answer. You're supposed to answer on the spot. And usually your answer comes from something that you love, you're passionate about, you enjoy, or something that you've experienced. And I wanna ask one more this or that question, and it's not about food, comics, seasons of the year, whether it be fall or summer. It's not about activities or or movies. Uh, It's actually about the place of your work or your workplace. And you don't need to answer this one out loud, but I'm, I'm gonna ask you to take just a few moments and really reflect on your place of work. Whether you have a full-time job, part-time job, self-employed, whatever the case may be, I want you to think about your place of work or the work that you do, and i.e. your coworkers, your managers, the people you interact with every day. And if you have that mental picture in your mind, my question to you is, is this, is, is your work secular or sacred? Is your work secular or sacred. And I would guess and maybe even argue on how you answer that question determines how you view your work and ultimately how you honor God through your work. And before I continue this morning, I just want to bring some clarification or some clarity to, to three words that I've used so far today already. I want to bring clarity to work, what I mean by work, what I mean by secular, and what I mean by sacred. And the first one is work. And I've thought a lot about this of how to clarify work. And really, I've, I've kind of lumped people into kind of three phases of what I would call work or places of work. And the very first one I want to start with today is that maybe you're in the house or watching online and maybe you are too young to work. Like legally, you cannot have a, a place of employment or a job to go to every single day. That You would fall into that category, that you are under, I think it's maybe 16 now, that you can have a job. But I would push back and maybe even argue a, a, a little bit that you actually have work to do that you have your schoolwork or you have your homework, i.e. work is in the name. You have one of the words that I hated as a kid, that you have chores or housework to do around the house to help your parents or to help adults in your life. But also you have your neighbors or the people around you in your neighborhood. And maybe you find yourself today in kind of the second phase of life or your second phase of work here today. And maybe you're on the, the opposite side of it in that you're retired First of all, I just want to say congratulations that you've made it to retirement. That is such an incredible milestone that you have made it all the way to retirement. And again, I'm going to lovingly and graciously push back on that as well. That if you're a part of your neighborhood, you have your neighbors to do work for. Are you serving your neighbors? You have your friends. Are you serving your friends? And if you're blessed to have a spouse, are you serving your spouse? And then I would argue the third is where we find most of ourselves in is that you have a place of employment to go to every day, every week. Maybe it's work from home, maybe it's going into the office, but these labels will be full-time, that you have full-time employment, you have part-time employment. And again, I would lovingly lump in unemployment into this phase that I hope and pray that you're not unemployed forever, but you would be a part really of this last phase of work. You could also have your own business, you can be self-employed, whatever the case may be that you have a a place of work. And as you think and kind of process your workplace today, I want you to kind of think about, again, the people that you work close with uh, in your place of work or in your work. So that'd be your coworkers, your managers, if you're part of the corporate structure, your corporate employees. I would also encourage you to think about the people you interact with every day, your customers or your customer base, for that matter. If you own your own job or if you're self-employed, same thing. Think about yourself, and if it's a joint, uh, a joint company with your spouse, your spouse, your employees, same thing, your customer base. So you see, no matter where you find yourself in the stage of life or in the stage of work, we all have work to do, and we can all honor God through those places. The next two words I want to clarify strictly by definition are sacred and secular. And again, by definition, secular is this, that secular work refers to work that is not related to religion or the church. The only secular work is work done by secular people. I love this last sentence, and we'll kind of circle this, highlight it, and get back to it. Work is secular or sacred based on who performs it and for whom it is performed. In sacred, again, by definition, dedicated or set apart for the service of worship of a deity. You know, in our culture, we have this mindset or kind of this posture, if you will, that the only jobs that are sacred are those that are in a position of ministry. And what I mean by position of ministry is clergy, is pastors, 
is missionaries, is office staff of the church, church leaders. Really, if you serve in any capacity in the church, your job is sacred and everything else is secular. And in my years as a Christ follower, I've been a Christian now for seven years, I think this is one of the areas or one of the dichotomies that the church has failed in some areas. In my experience, I've noticed that there are two camps or two polar extremes when it comes to your work. By definition, again, one is secular and then one is sacred. Like you either have a secular job or you have a sacred job and your secular job can never be sacred. And again, there's nothing in between. Can I just speak to that mindset, that posture this morning? I've been praying and kind of preparing for this message for the last couple weeks, and I really wanted to speak to this tension before we get into God's word, is that if you are a Christ follower here this morning or watching online, I wanna argue that your job is sacred, period. No questions asked. That you could be retired, you could not be old enough to work, You could be full-time, part-time. You can be in the financial space, the medical space, the educational space, construction. You could be mopping or sweeping floors, and you can be all the way to the CEO of a company. If you are a Christ follower, your job is sacred, period. This is what I struggled with when I was newly saved in in 2016. I was working full-time retail, and I had the, the thoughts, the emotions, kind of this mindset is that I'm a Christ follower now, I should go into full-time ministry. That's where I'll be most effective for the kingdom of God. Like I had that, that thought, those emotions, kind of this mindset is now, now that I'm a Christian and a follower of Jesus, my most effective place will be in full-time ministry. I am well aware of October 22nd, 2023. Yes, I am in full-time ministry. But if I look back on my life in 2016 when I was saved and working in my retail job, If I would have left retail for full-time ministry or what I thought was effective for the kingdom of God, it would have failed. And that's being fully honest. I would have left that retail place under my own power, my own strength, my own abilities, not God's. And it would have ultimately failed. And maybe you're here this morning or watching online and you have those same thoughts, those same feelings, that same mindset. This might be some of your thoughts that run through your head every day, is that I'm at a place of work and I feel like I'm working a secular job when I should be working a sacred job and doing more for the kingdom of God. I should pursue ministry. I should should pursue being a pastor. I should pursue being a missionary. I should pursue X, Y, or Z, but I should ultimately pursue a sacred job. Or maybe you're the opposite this morning and maybe you do work a secular job and your mindset is, I'm not in a sacred job, so why do I even need to honor God in my workplace? Author Oswald Chambers said this, and I love this quote. The spiritual manifests itself in a life which knows no division into sacred and secular. I'm gonna repeat that. The spiritual manifests itself in a life which knows no division into sacred and secular. Pastor and author John Piper also wrote this about our work. Don't assume that a change of location or a change of vocation, meaning your work, will mean that you are more devoted to Christ. Reread that one again. That's a heavy statement. Don't assume that a change of location or a change of vocation will mean that you are more devoted to Christ. And if we are Christ followers and we are to be devoted to following Christ and and becoming more and more in the image of of Jesus, I want to give you some overviews or just some quick thoughts and some highlights around work, the New Testament, and Jesus. Jesus told 52 parables. 45 of them had a workplace context. Jesus spent his adult life as a carpenter until the age of 30 when he began a public preaching ministry in the workplace. I love this. Jesus called 12 workplace individuals, not clergy, to build his church. Jesus called 12 workplace individuals, not clergy, to build his church. Work is worship. The root word in Hebrew for both work and worship is the same word. So no matter where you work, no matter your work setting, it is worship. Two more. 
Work in its different forms is mentioned more than 800 times in the Bible, more than all the words used to express worship, music, praise, and singing combined. And the last one is the New Testament records that Jesus appeared publicly 132 times, staggeringly 122 were in the marketplace. To me, those are fascinating observations of Jesus' work in the New Testament. So if we take that approach and really process those observations, no matter if your job is sacred or secular, there is an importance in being a part of the workplace and being engaged in the world around you. You have an incredible opportunity to make your workplace a better place because God has specifically placed you there for such a time as this. And you might be processing this morning, hearing that question that I proposed this morning is how can I honor God in my workplace? You might be thinking this is, Maybe you want to see God honored in your workplace. I would encourage you by start to honor God in your workplace right where you're at. And you might be thinking or processing, well, how can I honor God in my workplace? My workplace is is a difficult place to work or or difficult individuals to, to be around or difficult conversations are taking place. Or I work in an industry that is just brash and have this stigma of IE construction or trucking for that matter. Like it is just a difficult industry to work in. I wanna answer those or that question to you this morning. And I wanna just wanna walk through three questions with you this morning, look at God's word, and then give you practical how-tos on how to answer really those three questions. If you know any of my history or my background, I should a little bit, but previously to becoming full-time here at the church, I worked 13 years in the retail industry, and four, almost five of those 13 years was in management. So coming into the local church as a full-time pastor, I've seen both sides of this coin. I've worked a, by definition, a secular job, and now I work, by definition, a sacred job. But I've had this tension, is secular versus sacred. But if you're taking notes this morning, the first question that I wanna ask you this morning in regards to honoring God in your workplace is this, is are you honoring God with your work ethic? Are you honoring God with your work ethic? Proverbs 14, 23 out of the NIV says this. All hard work brings a profit, but mere talk leads. Excuse me. All hard work brings a profit, but mere talk leads only to poverty. You see, if a man works at his trade or a man works at his work, he gains by it. If he cultivates the earth, it will yield an increase. And in proportion, As he works hard, so will be his profit. But he who talks much labors little. And a man of words is seldom a man of deeds. Simple takeaway of this verse, less talk, more work. Proverbs 21, five out of the NIV says this, the plans of the diligent lead to profit as surely as haste leads to poverty. Same verse out of the NLT, which is the New Living Translation. Good planning and hard work lead to prosperity, but hasty shortcuts lead to poverty. You see, those that are quick to be rich, those that are looking for a get rich quick scheme, here's a warning from this verse. It doesn't work. You will eventually get burned. There is no quick way to riches. The thoughts of the diligent tend towards plentifulness, but the get rich schemes are going to leave you broke. God calls us to be faithful in our work ethic, no matter if it's a secular job or a sacred job, and he calls you to that day after day after day after day. Proverbs 10.4 out of the NIV says this, lazy hands make for poverty, but diligent hands bring wealth. Again, same verse out of the ESV. A slack hand causes poverty, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. Proverbs 12.11 out of the NIV Those who work their land will have abundant food, but those who chase fantasies have no sense. All of these verses so far under work ethic is there's a theme, is that God calls us to have a hard and a faithful work ethic. In his book, Christians in the Workplace, Pastor Charles Stanley writes this quote. One of the greatest hindrances to the gospel's effectiveness is Christians who act one way at church and another way elsewhere. The way we live for God should permeate all areas of life. The workplace is no exception. The way we act reflects our faith. So if we claim to be Christians, our coworkers, our bosses, employees, will equate our attitudes and actions 
with Jesus. And he ends this quote with a question I wanted to answer. Did those around you at the office see a positive reflection of God in your work ethic? How do you honor God with your work ethic? That's a great question. And I wanna walk through just three bigger observations that I've experienced in really in my 15 years of working 13 secular the last two as a, as a full-time staff pastor. Number one is, is this, just the practical how-to to honor God with your work ethic. Number one is arrive on time. If you've been given the expectation or the responsibility of a kind of a time frame of your job, whether it's seven to three, eight to four, nine to five, like whatever your scheduled time is for that day, and if you have the expectation of clocking in, whether that's a physical time clock, clocking in on your phone through an app, clock in on time. Don't go a minute over, don't go five minutes over, don't even clock in early, clock in on time. That shows that you have quality and faithful work ethic. Along the same lines that if you're given the opportunity to have a lunch break in your workplace, especially if it's an unpaid lunch break, don't abuse that. Yes, that goes to honesty and integrity and all those things, but around your work ethic that you are stealing time, that honor your lunch break. I know that sounds so silly and so simple, but that is a practical way how to honor God with your work ethic. The second one, goes right in line with this is put in a full day's work. Put in a full day's work. I read a quote about this. It says this, that it's more common for people to rob their employers through laziness than by misusing of office cash. That hit home. It's more common for people to rob their employers through laziness than by misusing office cash. And the last one is one of my favorites. Uh, It is exceed your role description, expectations, and responsibility. That whenever you were hired full-time, whatever start date you had at your company or within your promotion, you might have been given a new role description, expectations, responsibilities, kind of whenever you made that transition. Whatever your expectations are at your job, I challenge you, not just encourage, I challenge you to exceed those expectations. Don't just put forth a status quo average effort at your workplace. God does not call us to work below the expectations. God calls us to rise above those expectations. And if you're in a position to increase your skills, whether that's in the financial space, the educational space, medical space, whatever your work or your workplace is, even in retirement, that if you have the ability to increase your skills or your knowledge in your work, do so. What I mean by that is listen to podcasts, read books, listen to audio books if you have a longer commute for your work. Go to conferences if you can. Listen to teachings that are made by professionals in your area of work. And if you have a coworker, maybe that is a couple promotions ahead of you where you think you wanna get to, Ask them questions. Hey, how did you get here? What was your work ethic like in that situation? What was your work ethic like with with that scenario or that individual or that project? Liddy, these are practical how-to ways to honor God in your workplace. And we honor God when we do quality work. Second question I wanna ask you today around your work or your workplace is this, is are you honoring God with your integrity? Are you honoring God with your integrity? There's gonna be a bunch of verses rapid fire. There's seven in a row. I hope that you stay with me. Proverbs 11, three. The integrity of the upright guides them, but the unfaithful are destroyed by their duplicity. Proverbs 12, 22. The Lord detests lying lips, but he delights in people who are trustworthy. Proverbs 21, three. To do what is right and just is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. Proverbs 10, nine. Whoever walks in integrity walks securely, but he who makes his ways crooked will be found out. Proverbs 28, six. Better is a poor man who walks in his integrity than a rich man who is crooked or crooked in his ways. Proverbs 19, one. Better is a poor person who walks in his integrity than the one who is crooked in speech and is a fool. And the last one is Proverbs 20, verse seven. The righteous who walks in his integrity Blessed are his children after him. Side note, that last verse hit home. 
having almost a, a nine-month-old daughter, this verse is, is telling me, is speaking to me, that I can apply to my own life, that if I have children, if you have children, or if you have generations to, to follow you, that your integrity and how you live your life today affects the generations to come. That is so weighty in a, a healthy way, that your integrity now will affect future generations. C.S. Lewis made this statement in regards to integrity. You might have heard this quote, but it's this. That is, integrity is doing the right thing even when no one is watching. Integrity is doing the right thing even when no one is watching. Titus 2, verses 7 and 8 in the New Testament. Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works, and in your teaching show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned so that an opponent may be put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. You know, followers of Christ are to demonstrate dependability, trustworthiness, and integrity when, it, when called upon to deliver a, a service or when called upon to be in your place of work or your work. Because God is trustworthy and because we are called to be image bearers of Christ and to emulate his character, it is vital that we too are full of integrity and how to honor God in your integrity at work. Here are some of my observations. Number one is be absolutely and meticulously honest and trustworthy on the job. Whatever your job, whatever your work is, be absolutely and meticulously honest and trustworthy on the job. You know, and if, if you're in a position to offer advice, like if you're, if you're in a position of management, of, of leadership, if you have people working under you, Make sure your advice you give is also the advice you live. Meaning, do your actions back up your words outside of work? Be accountable for your actions at work. You know, if you've missed a project or a, a deadline based off of that project, or if you've maybe used too many resources, or you maybe gone over the budget that you were given for that project, man, own that. Own that in your work or in your workplace. Maybe you've missed a deadline on a project or, or maybe you've, uh, again, just overused some of the resources that you've been given. Take accountability for that. Own up to that. That that shows your integrity, that shows your character, that shows that you are honest in your work or in your workplace. And this, this other one might be a, a little uncomfortable for some, but if you see unethical or immoral behavior at your work or your workplace, say something. You might be thinking to yourself, again, these are all practical, simple things. And you might be thinking to yourself that your job is not of significance. You might have a menial job or that thing that you see that you interact with is very maybe simple in, in nature or it's not that big of a deal. It is a big deal. Say something. This phrase goes, if you see something, say something. Be also truthful and honest in your work or your workplace. Have the best work ethic possible. Avoid gossiping about coworkers under the pretense of venting. Avoid gossiping about coworkers under the pretense of venting. And just being honest, this is one of the ones uh, that I struggle with, and it's being honest in trustworthy in my job, not now, but I was working retail in, again, my previous 13 years of vocation. I had this, kind of this, this tension, especially in 2016, when I started following Jesus, is I was in a, a position to serve and care for those that I interacted with on a daily basis. And the place of my employment had a policy uh, against taking expired coupons, discounts, uh, anything like that, sales prices, whatever the case may be, I had this mentality or this mindset in my place of work that I was just gonna take care of the customer no matter what, that I would kind of take the, the brunt of getting yelled at for maybe overusing expired coupons, discounts, whatever the case may be. After I accepted Christ in 2016, that started to, to weigh on me. That started to become a conviction. And later, before I left that place of employment in 2021, I didn't do that anymore. Because in that process of, of accepting expired coupons or discounts, I know that sounds silly, but I was going against our company policy and I was not being full of integrity to my company. 
in your place of work or in your work, our integrity can lead others to know Christ. So, so far the question is, are you honoring God with your work ethic? Are you honoring God with your integrity? And the last question I wanna ask you today is, are you honoring God with your love? Are you honoring God with your love? You know, it's not just about what we do, but how we do it. Your work and how you do it affects others. Some produce great products, but in the process, they run all over others. Our work for the honor of God must serve those around us. We serve others by what we make and how we make it. Our work must be empowered by the Spirit and filled with the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5.22 says this, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, is joy, is peace, is forbearance. Some translations are patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Imagine how different and enjoyable your workplace might be if the fruit of the Spirit was manifested there. Well, guess what? It starts with you, and it also starts with me. We collectively have to pray for it, and we collectively have to seek after it. If you think your work is too small to make a difference, then consider the great effect that the kindness, the mercy, and the love that was shown to you by an individual, then you can then take to your workplace and how it has affected your life. John 13, 34 and 35 says this, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. You know, love is one of those feelings or those emotions that we say we are good at doing. You know, you might have said statements or heard statements, I love my spouse, I love my kids, I love my job, I love my friends, I love whatever fill in the blank is for you in that particular space. And I would argue that I fail at that and I would argue that we all would fail at the love that is required to honor God in our work and also in our places of work. The type of love that is required is called agape love. And that love requires nothing in return to show the love to that individual who you are working alongside or just in the work that you do. You know, and that type of love says this, that I will choose your desires over the desires that I have for my own life. That type of love says that I will take time every day, my drive into work or before I start work, if you work from home or whatever the case may be, is that I'm gonna take time and I'm gonna pray for my workplace that I'm gonna pray for the individuals that I know that I'm gonna interact with on a daily basis, whether it be a manager, a coworker, customers, and maybe honestly, if you're honest, some of those frustrate you, that you're gonna take time and that you're gonna pray for them, that you are gonna intercede on their behalf to the God of the universe. That, that love also, type, also says that you take time for yourself and that you pray, God, use me in my work or in my place of work today that your love is on display, not mine. Because if it's my love on display, it's going to fail in honoring you. That love also says that I will choose your schedule over my own schedule. I know that might push back on some that we are rigid to our schedules or we are very routine to our schedules, but that love, agape love, says that I will choose your schedule over mine. That type of love also says that I will lay down my wants, my desires, my needs at the expense of moving the company forward in a healthy, honorable way. That I will lay myself down so that the company can be furthered in a healthy, honorable way. That love also says that I will serve you at the expense of me, whatever that looks like. If it's rearranging schedules, if it's giving financial help, if it's taking time to pray for that individual or individuals, plural, that is, I'm going to serve you at the expense of me. That love also says that I'm going to empathize with those around you in in your places of work. You never know what someone is carrying or walking in with on a daily basis. You might be aware of that individual that they look stressed or anxious or overwhelmed And you can just be a listening ear in that moment, that you can try to put yourself in the shoes of that individual. And one of my favorite verses is Galatians 6, that we will bear one another's burdens as to to fulfill the law of Christ, that you will empathize, that you will love that individual in that moment. And in that moment, you are becoming the hands and feet of Jesus 
to the individual of your workplace. That love also says that you'll be patient in some of your conversations. You know, I've asked this question uh, around men's wing night the last couple weeks of life groups and some of the responses that I've gathered are around this theme of being patient or being gracious or kind with, with individuals that they work with. Again, depending on the industry or depending on your vocation, you might have some brash or some very strong personality people you work with. That love says you're gonna be patient with that individual. You're not gonna be quick-witted. You're not gonna be quick to speech. You're not gonna, I was gonna say pop off, but that's Rosemary's language. You're not gonna do that. You're, you're gonna be patient. Rosemary, uh, I, I work too close with her, I guess. Uh, you're gonna be patient with that individual. You are going to have the fruit of the spirit that we read before in Galatians 5.22. And one of the last big ones is that if you see an individual that you work with, that this type of love also says that you are gonna take some of the workload off of that individual. That if you, again, see them that they are stressed, anxious, overwhelmed, that they're not gonna meet a, a deadline or a project at your place of work, or maybe just in your work in general, that you're gonna come alongside of them and you're gonna serve that individual and you're gonna say, hey, you know what? I see you, I see that you're a little overwhelmed. How can I help you? How can I take some of that work off of your shoulders that you are not overwhelmed, that you are not stressed, that you can breathe, that you don't have to be filled with anxiety or worry or stress because you're gonna miss this deadline, that you're gonna come alongside of that individual and you are gonna love that individual. Colossians 3, 23 through 24 says this, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. So my questions to you this morning around your work, again, if you're too young to work, if you're retired, if you have a place of employment, even if you're unemployed as well, are these questions. Are you honoring God with your work ethic? Are you honoring God with your integrity? Are you honoring God with your love? And I know that these three questions are not the exhaustive list of honoring God at your workplace. There are a multitude of ways to honor God in your work or in your workplace. But I strongly believe that if you start with these three things, work ethic, integrity, and the love of those around you, that you will see your place of work or your work change. And lastly, it's because that God is at work in you as much on Monday morning as he is at work in you on Sunday morning. My challenge in my prayer to you this morning is don't be an idiot with your work, meaning honor God in your workplace. I know it's difficult for some to honor God in your workplace through interactions, through, through conversations, through the people you deal with, through maybe the work itself is, is hard to honor God in your work. But again, I will push back that if you are a Christ follower in this place, that your job is not, is not secular, that your job is sacred. And who you are and for whom it is done makes it sacred. If you go to work today, if you go to work on Monday morning, I challenge you to work on those three things. Honor God with your work ethic, honor God with your integrity, and honor God in your love to those around you. Would you pray with me this morning? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, again, for the opportunity to, to gather this morning. God, I thank you so much for your word. God, that we can look at your word and, and apply it practically to our lives. God, I ask, whether it's today or throughout the week, God, as, as we go to our places of work or we have work to do, God, I ask that you challenge us that you give us opportunities that we can honor you in our, in our work. God, that we can honor you with, an, with a honorable work ethic, with a faithful work ethic. God, that we can honor you with our integrity. God, that we can be the same individual we are in public as we are in private. God, that we can honor you with, with the love of those individuals around us. God, make us aware of those opportunities. God, open our eyes to see those individuals, God, that, that need you in, in a desperate way. God, I pray as we all go today, God, I pray that you go with us. God, that your presence is going before us. God, that you are strengthening us and that you are keeping us. God, again, I ask that as, as we go into the workplace, into the marketplace, maybe today or tomorrow throughout this week, God, that you are with us. 
God, that you are strengthening us and you are helping us honor you through our work. We thank you, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. This is Pastor Nick Pohl, the lead pastor at Calvary. We're so glad you joined us for today's podcast. I hope you enjoyed the message. At Calvary Church, we're passionate about leading people into an overflowing life with Jesus. We would love the opportunity to connect with you on your faith journey and hear what God is doing in your life or join you in prayer for any needs you might have. You can visit us online at calvaryirwin.com or send us an email at info at calvaryirwin.com. On our website, you'll find previous week's messages, a list of upcoming events, as well as resources designed to help you take those next steps on your journey of faith. See you next week, and may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. 